Hello, everyone, and welcome to a talent development webinar from D Brown Consulting. I'm David Brown, your host, and I'm very glad to have you here. And sorry for this late start. All right, great. So today we're going to talk about training evaluation. That's our topic for the day. So, well, your speaker today is David. That's me, David Brown. I've been doing this for like 20 something years, training and developing courses, talent development, I've been involved in the industry for quite a while. I'm also an ATD master trainer and ATD master instructional designer. So that's me. And I do a lot of technical stuff like building financial models and stuff, but also, of course, designing training. That's, I think I like that more. So about the sponsors, D Brown Consulting are the sponsors for this webinar. It's D Brown Consulting. We do training, consulting, and payroll. Training bit is more analysts. We're the analyst trainers. We train analysts, financial analysts, reporting analysts, data analysts, any analyst. If you go over to office traininghub.com, you'll see some of our online e-learning courses, but we are the analyst trainers. And consulting-wise, we build financial models and we build BI solutions for deals using Power BI. And we have a payroll package which guarantees confidentiality because we know that confidentiality is the most important thing for any payroll. And of course, calculating the accurate, accurate taxes and accurate salaries is correct. It's important, but confidentiality is really key. So we have a service that guarantees that. We have our courses, more as I said, analyst courses. That's what we do mostly. So thus we have financial analyst, financial modeling, business intelligence, Excel, and then we have a bunch of online courses as well. And we have affiliates, financial, financial modeling institute, Microsoft and ATD. Those are our core affiliates. And for those that like technical stuff, you'd like to join our meetup groups. We have free meetup groups, meetup groups for financial modeling, meetup groups for Power BI, uh, meetup groups for Excel. So if you join those meetup groups, you'll be able to get a notification and invites to our live meetups and our online webinars. So this topic is mainly kind of started off by Don, uh, Donald Kirkpatrick, yeah? And he is the Don, so to say, of evaluation. He developed uh, four levels of evaluation, and that has been the gold standard for evaluation ever since. I think he developed that in the 50s, I mean, in a pretty long time ago. He's late now. He passed away, unfortunately, in 2014, but at least he, he had a really wonderful life and has contributed extremely heavily to the training and development and talent and development industry. He was once the president of uh, ASTD, that's currently called AT, Association for Talent Development, and he's written so many books on uh, management and training, and he's really um, positively affected the training industry. I mean, he, his name will live on for a very, very, very long time. So here we're going to talk about those three levels, and we're also actually going to talk about what they call the New World Kirkpatrick Model, which is a slight modification to the old model. So it's quite um, a nice thing we're going to talk about there, as in the new, the new additions to the four levels. So if you already know the four levels, then you have to know whether you know the uh, additions to the four levels. So let's get started. There are really four levels of evaluation, and uh, we're going to discuss these four levels, and we have some comments there and see how everybody um, uses those four levels. So the number one level, if anyone knows what it is, type it in the chat. What is level one? What is level one? Who knows? Type in the chat. So we're going to start with level one. So what's level one? Who knows level one? So there are four levels. Level one, level two, level three, level four. What is the first level of evaluation. People don't want to, just type, type, type. Okay, nobody wants to type. Just guess, if you can, just guess. All 
Okay. So the first level of evaluation is reaction. So the first thing you need to evaluate is reaction. Now, I, I think nearly every training in the world, or when they say, oh, do you evaluate training? They say, yeah, yeah, we evaluate training. And what they really do is just level one. Level one, there's level one, level two, level three, level four. But I know most people, when you ask them, do you evaluate training? They say yes, and it's actually just level one, reaction. What did we mean by reaction? You remember those uh, forms you give people at the end of the training and say, hey, please fill this form, fill this evaluation form. And then you say, did you, how well did you understand what was taught? Very well so, not so well, or, or not satisfactory. How, how well did the, did the facilitator give you time to practice? All those typical questions are basically measuring reaction, right? So you're measuring customer satisfaction or your customer being the participant, right? Yeah, so that's, that's what was originally defined in Kirkpatrick's model, reaction. So in the new world Kirkpatrick model, the new world addition, so if you go onto their website, you'll see the new world addition is engagement. So it's not just reaction we're measuring. We want to also understand the degree to which participants are actively involved in, in and contributing to the learning experience. So we also have to measure engagement. So part of level one is reaction, but add to it engagement. And then also relevance. That's another thing which they've added to level one. So we're measuring not just reaction, but engagement and relevance. So the degree to which training participants will have the opportunity to use or apply what they've learned on training, I mean, in the training on their job. So that is the relevance. So you could do a training that's absolutely not relevant to your job. So that's, uh, you should measure that in part of the reaction. So level one is reaction, yes, but you should also see, look out for engagement and relevance as part of level one. So how many of us here do level one? Just say yes or no. Yeah, so relevance is key and I think is one of the most um, most used levels of evaluation. Yeah. In, um, re, uh, re, reaction really yeah reaction and then we've talked about engagement and relevance being the new world additions to the um, uh, level one so let me just type that in the chat so you remember so it's engagement and reaction oh no it's not, not reaction relevance relevance being the new additions so great so what is level two if, if, if level one is reaction, which is what we do every time, we just put uh, prints out to those uh, forms and people fill the forms and says, yes, the training was very nice, excellent, the food was good. <laughs> what is level two? Someone should type level two. So what is level two? Come on, type, please. Type, type, type. What is level two? I'm waiting for you guys. You have to participate. You have to engage i need to get you guys engaged yes and is this relevant to you i'm doing my own level one evaluation right now so can you tell me what is level two okay Nobody wants to tell me what level two is. Okay, let's just move on to level two. So level two, when it comes for evaluation, is learning. So level two is learning. Yes, the whole idea of training is learning, but really has knowledge been passed across. So when it comes to learning, what you're really asking yourself is, mm, you know, whenever you train, right? And this is, this is the old Kirkpatrick model, which I still use a lot. Whenever you're training, if you're a trainer or you're a facilitator, you're trying to affect three things, three main things. You're trying to affect either skill, knowledge, or attitude. Or better put, knowledge, skill, and attitude in that order. Okay? So when you're measuring, evaluating, you're evaluating whether or not you've affected knowledge, whether knowledge has passed, skill has passed, and an attitude has changed. But really, level two, if I want to define it properly, let me give an example. When you say knowledge, you mean you know something. I know it. So 
I, after the training, do I know this thing? Yeah, I know it. So knowledge has passed across. Skill is if you can actually implement or do it, you can do it right then and then. In that training, you were actually able to do it, right? I can do it right now kind of stuff. Then what about attitude? I believe this will be worthwhile to my job. That's you. You have an attitude that says, mm, this is going to be useful for me. So this is still during the training, right? So you know it, you can do it, and you believe that it will be worthwhile for you on the job. So that's your knowledge, skill, and attitude. But the new world additions to this is confidence and commitment. Those are the two new additions to the level two learning. So the new world Kirkpatrick model added confidence and commitment to these learning level two. So confidence basically means uh, I think I can do it on the job. So you, I think you can do it. So the attitude was I believe this will be worthwhile. But I think I can do it. Then commitment is I intend to do it. So how do you measure that intention? For people that people intend to do it so that's all still part of level two learning yeah so how many of us do level two actually measuring knowledge skill and attitude so let me tell you how we do it when we do our trainings during the training because this is actually measured during the training itself how can you measure knowledge skill and attitude during the training so for us, we do a lot of technical courses. So for example, we do Excel, we do PowerPoint, we do visualization and stuff. So when we're doing that training, what we have is we have a clicker. We have clickers. All participants have a clicker. And that clicker is what they're going to use to answer very short quizzes during the training. So let's say two hours pass or four, four hours pass, there's a, a quiz comes up and they ask you ask a question with the A, B, C, D option. And you're supposed to use your clicker to click and answer. So obviously, if you get the answer right, it seems that it means you know it. And another thing we do in our trainings is you actually practice what we teach. Since it's technical, and most times we're using a computer, they actually have to practice. They have to go there and type, go there and answer, write this formula, and actually do it. So yes, we can measure skill. But attitude, I believe this will be worthwhile to do on the job. The way we measure that is really a discussion to say, okay, how are you going to apply this on the job? You've done this, thing. how are you going to apply it? And you have a general discussion. It could be a peer-to-peer, -peer, just a simple peer-to-peer. -peer. And then you can now um, give give the general group a, a feedback, a feedback loop where I say, yeah, yeah, this is how I'm going to use it on the job. Then you, you now reach the confidence level. Because of that peer-to-peer, -peer, there's more confidence. And hopefully, there will be a commitment. So why, how, you measure, how you do that commitment or how you ensure that commitment is getting people to actually write it down. Writing it down or even emailing each other, committing to do that new learning or to use that new learning. So that's level two. It's, it's still on the, in the training. You haven't left the training yet. You're still, this is level two measurement. So how many of us do that? So the learning, um, I don't know how much of that you heard. I was talking about learning being during the training, you're checking whether knowledge, skill, and attitude has, has been affected by the training. And I said that we use clicker technology. So we have a clicker every participant gets, and they answer questions during the training so we understand whether they're assimilating. is extremely important because... When you ask people, do you understand? And they say, yes. I mean, that's not how to ask. Do you <laughs> Actually give them a quiz. Just give them a very short quiz. And there's so many other techniques to, to help you measure whether knowledge, skill has, and skill has, has been affected and even attitude. So what you could do is you could do word puzzles. You could do a very simple word puzzle and ask them to fill out the puzzle based on all the things you've taught them that day. That's a really, really cool, easy way to, to measure uh, knowledge, skill, and attitude during the training. And then what the new world additions were, were confidence and commitment. So let's go to level three. Level three is behavior. So level three is behavior. Now, behavior is a very key aspect. And how do you measure behavior? Right? How do you measure behavior? Behavior typically is the degree to which uh, uh, participants apply what they've learned 
during the training when they are back. Uh, I mean, they're applying what they've learned during the training when they're back on the uh, job, when they're back at their desk. How, how, how well do they apply it? What's the degree of application? Right? So behavior, how, how would you ensure that behavior is measured? So obviously there was behavior before the training, and then maybe a week or two weeks after the training, there's behavior after. I can give you an, a, a classic example. I, I had a client. We went to a client and kind of after a course, a major course was done, just to ask about how participants were doing. Are they using the skills? And then we got a response that, nope, they're not using the skills. They learned it. When they came back, they were excited. But when they were now asked like a month later to exhibit that skill or to, to use that skill to do something, they couldn't. And they were not really happy. They've spent all this money. There doesn't, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a return on investment. And what happened is we've built behavior into our design. But the issue was they hadn't done that behavior piece. So what we did is we we have an assignment. We put an assignment uh, at the end of the course and said, look, you need to do this assignment within a week of completing this course or you're going to forget about everything. And really that's what it is. So most times you forget. So that assignment the only thing that we didn't do as well was monitor them or talk to the client and say, hey, uh, your people have an assignment. Please, could you monitor them to make sure they're done within a week? And your key buy-in will be from their supervisor. You need to be able to talk to their supervisor and then make sure or, or kind of sit to the supervisor and let him understand why level three is very important and you need to change behavior. And the only way to change behavior is if people are allowed to or encouraged to apply what they've learned on the job. And how you facilitate that is two ways. You could give an assignment and then you could also give a post-training support. Post-training the support mostly in the sense of maybe like a, an online, maybe small refresher. So uh, there are online tools, online training tools you could give, and then make sure you follow up to ensure they actually do it. Because there's no point giving doing some uh, tools and people are not doing it. So, so that's how you affect behavior. Can anyone tell me another methodology you use to ensure that level three happens? And when you evaluate behavior, you could actually see a behavior change. Anyone care to share? The new world edition, you know, I said this is the new Kirkpatrick model. So what have what have they added to this Kirkpatrick model of, of behavior? Well, they basically added drivers. So they basically so what are the drivers or the or the processes and systems that actually reinforce or encourage uh, or even reward performance of this critical behavior change you're trying to look for on the job, right? So, so you're yeah, looking for changes in behavior on the job. You need to basically have systems in place, processes in place uh, that will reinforce and encourage that change. So that's all part of the uh, level three behavior. Okay, so we're moving to the last, um, the last level of evaluation. And what was that last level? The last level is results. So level is results. The last level is do you measure results? How well do you measure results? So the degree to which targeted outcomes occur of training accountability package. So that's generally what results are. So you could even call it a bit of return on investments, right? So we're measuring results. Now, who does this measurement? How do you really measure results itself? In practical terms, you can say that um, the training has resulted in a 50% increase in something or, or the training has resulted in 20% savings in time. Anybody here? Okay, so Lawrence uses appraisals. So use appraisals to measure results. Uh, and and then of course when maybe uh, if I'm getting you right somebody scored maybe uh, evaluation was sixty percent 
And after the training, evaluation went up to 75% because performance went up. And you now attribute, the only issue with that is attribution. How are we going to attribute that performance gain to the training? Because a lot of other things are also affecting performance. Who knows? The guy could have probably uh, been trying to look for a house for six good months. He's homeless and he finally got a nice house and now he's relaxed and now his performance has increased. And we think it's actually the training he did two months ago. So it's, it's uh, attribution it becomes an issue, right? Well, Lawrence, do you, do you find that issue as attribution? It'd be nice if you, you can put your mic up, Lawrence. I would like to like you to contribute because I don't just like myself talking every time. So if you could request for a mic uh, for to speak, I can then uh, release your, your mic so you can speak. I'd like to hear from Lawrence if it's possible. All right. Okay, so that is results. So results, we understand results. But then, there, as I said, there's a new world addition. So there's the new world Kirkpatrick model. And the new world Kirkpatrick model adds a leading indicators to the results um, level four. So level four, should, yes, you should have results, return on investment, but you should also calculate leading indicators. Yeah. So short term observations and measurements suggesting that critical behavior are on track or, or um, to create a positive impact on desired results. So quick observations and then those measurements that actually tell you that things have changed. So this leads to return on investments, really. That's what results are. And, and you should be able to actually calculate return on investments. But let's give a little bit of credit to Kirkpatrick for this model that he developed. And our ATD in 2000, I believe, is it 20, 2003? I can't really remember when exactly. They paid a tribute to, um, um, to Kirkpatrick. And that was just probably a year or two before he passed away. So let me play that short couple of minutes tribute for you. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to recognize Don Kirkpatrick, a legend in our field. With 2011 marking the final year of regular speaking engagements, this ASD International Conference and Exposition is the last opportunity for all of us to hear from Don. We interviewed Don about the origin of the four levels of evaluation and what he thinks is critical for the future of the field. Here's Don. You know, that's about the most uh, common question I'm asked. How did you come up with the four levels? And I tell you, it's a long story, but I was teaching at the Management Institute at the University of Wisconsin, and I had my master's degree from, from the School of Business. I decided to want to get my PhD, and in doing that, I decided I'm going to do evaluating the program I was teaching in. Between then and ninth, that was in 1954, when I got my PhD, I had gone to the School of Education and evaluated the programs basically one and two, but I had said something. I said, the day of reckoning probably is going to come when top management is going to look for more than level one and level two, which are reaction learning. So then between 54 and 59, I did some research on behavior and results. I went into companies. I found out, are you using what you learned? And if so, what can you show any evidence of productivity or quality or more sales or anything from it? So I did some research. And then in 1959, Bob Craig, the editor of the ASTD Journal, called me and said, Don, I understand you've done some research on evaluation. Would you write an article? And I said, Bob, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll write four articles, one on reaction, one on learning, one on behavior, and one on results. He said, we've never published this series before. And I said, it's a good time to start. So the value of that book is not just my four articles. The value of that book is the case studies we have for, from Toyota and from Caterpillar and from IBM and from a lot of other companies. And people have been able to look at those case studies and say, well, here's a reaction sheet I'm going to use. 
or here's how I'm going to measure learning, or here's what I can do to measure behavior, or here's what I can do to measure results. And that is one of the reasons why it's been so popular throughout the world is because the case studies are not just my, my concepts and theories and principles and techniques. So I would suggest the real key to the future is to build this partnership with managers, get them on board. In one of our books implementing the four levels, I've written a chapter on how to get managers on board. And that's what you need. And you need top management involved as a partnership in terms of just, it isn't just training that by itself it's doing it. It's the things that they want you to accomplish and then you know that ahead of time and then you know what your objectives can be and I think that's the trend in the future. And if you want to be successful in the training profession, let me suggest you take that advice about get managers on board and starting with them saying, if you want this program, what do you want us to accomplish and what are your expectations and what does success look like to you? Don, on behalf of ASTD and everyone here today, thank you for your service to the association, your colleagues, and organizations worldwide. You have helped learning professionals everywhere understand the importance and the impact of measuring our work. Don, please stand so we can recognize you for your work. We're back, and um, so that was excellent. That's just a tribute to Don. And uh, so what did we learn from that? Any key points that we can take out of that? Can we just type in the chat? Any key points we can take out of that um, short talk by Donald Kirkpatrick? Well, one, one I got was get managers involved, get them on board. So get those managers on board, get them, get your supervisors on board, because if you do a training, you go back and your supervisor is not on board, you can, you, your return on investment is just going to go down the drain. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Lawrence got that as well. Get the managers on board. What else did we get? Another key thing you should always ask, if you're, if you're designing a course, and, and I'm an instructional designer, actually an ATD master instructional designer, and the easiest question you can ask a client that will help you understand whether or not the training will really make sense is, what does success look like to you? That's a key question. What does success look like to you? So just ask your manager that or ask your MD that when you say, no, I need this training. Okay, what does success look like to you? Then write down everything that person says and then ask yourself, so if this is what success looks like, what can I do to make that happen? What changes do I need to make and what are we going to put in the training that would affect that change? And that will give us those four levels that we're talking about, right? So what does success look like to you? So for us here, as in what I want to do is just ask us a little question. Let me do a quick poll. I'm just evaluating myself here a bit. Let's, let me ask you this question. So I'm asking... Um, So where are you based on what you've learned so far? Do you know it? Can you do it? Is it worthwhile? Do you think you can do it on the job? Or do you intend to do it on the job? So let's answer those. 
That's just what you've learned today, right? Just what you've just learned, right? Based on what you've learned so far. So intending to do it on the job, that takes a while, really. So I can agree that no one's answering. They are saying they intend to do it on the job. Uh, I think I can do it on the job. Well, again, maybe level three, level four is very tough for some people. But level one and two, I think you can actually do level one and two. Level three and four needs a little bit more planning. All right, so I'm going to end the poll. Right, so here I want to talk about um, return on investment, right? Return on investment. And if you look at the screen, I have a book by um, Jack Phillips. He's also one of the top uh, dons in, in return on investment. He's very well known for return on investment calculation in the industry. And Ron Drew, Ron Drew, uh, Ron Drew Stone, those are the two that wrote this book. How to Measure Training Results. It's actually a very valuable book. It's a practical guide to tracking the six key indicators. So they have six key indicators that they've put in. And well, the six key indicators is just another way of the, like the four levels. Okay, so you know, there are different models for everything. There's ADI, there's SAM. All of them say practically the same thing, right? So there are six indicators. So uh, uh, first of all, he has a 10-stage process for measurements. That's what they have. They have a 10-stage process. So I'm going to just run through these 10 stages for you. You could write them down. But this 10-stage process for measuring return on investment. And then I'll just do a very quick demo on maybe on Excel of a return on investment calculation, a very simple return on investment calculation that you could use before going into the complex ones. So what are those 10 stages or to process, um, 10 stage process for measuring or for measurement of return on investment? Let's have a look at that. Okay, I can see um, Lawrence's comments, very true, that um, it seems only Lawrence is commenting, everybody else is quiet, why? Anyway. Um, level four was also a bit difficult to achieve, and he's thinking it's because the managers you didn't get the managers on board. And usually, that's what happens if the managers are not on board, the supervisors are not on board, the CEO is not on board, things will not change. All right, okay, so that's a good one. So, let me quickly go through these 10. So, we have develop training objectives as number one. So if you really want to do calculate return on investments, the first thing you need to do is really develop training objectives. And your training objectives must follow what we call Bloom's taxonomy. If you know Bloom's, if you don't know, just check him out. Just go online for Bloom's uh, when it comes to creating objectives. And you have to create objectives at each level. So that's level one, level two, level three, level four. You must create objectives for all those uh, four levels. Now, Jack Phillips, he, his, own, um, his own model has five levels. So his five, five levels are reaction, learning, application, impact, and return on investment. So, of course, if you remember Kirkpatrick's uh, levels were um, re um, reaction, learning, behavior, and results. So here we have reaction, learning, application, which is behavior, impact, which I guess is results, and then return on investment. So everyone kind of builds their own little levels, right? So how do you, when you develop uh, training objectives, the basis for the measurement really is at the end of the day, you're a business. So most of us do corporate training. You need to increase revenue or reduce cost your training, you should be able to track whether or not your training increased revenue or reduced cost. And if you can't track that, then you're not doing return on investment calculations. And the best way to track is to write very clear-cut objectives. Write objectives for reaction, for learning. So an example for an objective for reaction is you need to define a specific level of satisfaction and reaction to the training as it relates to the participants and as delivered to the participants. So we all do that. We do reaction, we do learning. 
divine, uh, defining a specific knowledge or skill to be developed. That's the learning, right? The application, on the other hand, is you need to define behavior that must change. So what behavior must change? That's the application. The impact is to define the specific business metric, the specific business measure that needs to change. So you, you find out what that metric is before, and then after the training, you measure it again. That way you'll be able to calculate good return on investment. So the next, um, the next objective or the next... Uh, in the framework, we're talking about, um, not Patrick now, we're talking about Jack Phillips' 10-stage uh, process of measurement. So the next thing is develop evaluation plans and baseline data. So you need, obviously, a starting point. What's my starting point? What's current state analysis before the training happens? And you as an, a training uh, expert need to sit down with your manager or sit down with your client and draft what exactly your um, baseline data is. So hard data categories, you I mean you could include things like, um, I don't know, how much waste do you currently generate? Maybe you're, you're, you're trying to reduce paper usage or something. How do you effectively communicate or how do you effectively review without using paper? So okay, how much waste do you currently have, right? And that's quality. And then the the output as well. What's, uh, what's your production like? How, how much work is currently being done? So, well, you have, you just have certain metrics that you write down and that becomes your base data, right? So that, that's cr critical or else you not know what you're measuring to. You can't say I improved. How would you improve? So stuff like, uh, just list out factors when developing an evaluation, location, duration, participants, involvements, management, interests. Those are just some factors. So next thing you should do is collect that data during the training. So what we do is that clicker clicker technology, you collect all that data, how people are doing during the training. Once we do what we like to do all that data collection, we do the measurement before and then during the training. We now gather that data. You can use Excel to analyze it, or you can use Power BI to analyze it. But you collect the data nonetheless. Then after collecting the data, you have to collect the data again after the training. So you've collected during, you've collected before, you've collected during, you also need to collect after. So that's the key part, really, after the training. How do you collect the data now? If you're a consultant, obviously you need to go back to the client or ask the client to collect the data and give you the data so you can analyze. Or if you're working there, you don't just finish the training and leave. You need to go back to the managers, ask them to get that data. But you'd have planned all this in the beginning before you even start the training. So collect the data after the training. So follow-up surveys, for example, you could use. Observations on the job, you could use. That's, a, that's data collection. Yeah, you could do interviews, follow-up interviews with the manager, with them, themselves. You could even have focus groups to collect the data. All that is how you collect data. Those are methodologies for collecting data. Yeah, you can even give an assignment like we like to do. We give an assignment related to the training and say, hey, you must finish this assignment by so-so -so date. Complete the market and then we rate it. We give them with actual, actual rating. So all that is data collection after the training. All right? So that's number four. You know, there's a 10-stage process. So... Okay, I've just given you some ideas here. All right, so then, okay, yeah, we were actually supposed to have a guest speaker today, but unfortunately he couldn't make it, so that's why I've just prolonged my talk. Usually every month we have a guest speaker, and then um, the guest speaker, we at least talk about their own experiences and what we're talking about. So isolating the effects of training is the next, um, that's stage five in our 10 stage process, right? So stage five is, stage five is isolating the effects of training. Again, to be able to do that, you need to probably have a control group. So you have people that w did not do the training and then there are people that did the training. So whatever data you're collecting, you have the, those that didn't do the training, how well are they doing after the training? Those that did the training, how well are they doing after the training? So those are two things you need to, to do. That's an example of how you can isolate the effects of training. 
There are many other ways, but um, that's just an example. The next stage, again, okay, let me just leave this slide for you. You could have a look at some other examples. So forecasting is just you're using a predictive model. Yeah, so various predictive model in changing variables and stuff like that. But control groups are really, uh, I think, pretty, pretty effective. All right, so the next thing is you convert data to monetary value. How do you convert data to monetary value? So a simple way which I'm going to show you in the example is, well, how long were you doing this task for? I was doing this task. It took me two and a half hours to do this task. After the training, one month after the training, how long are you doing this task for? Oh, it's taking me one hour. So you've saved one and a half hours. Maybe you save one and a half hours every week. So if you save one and a half hours every week and you do 50 weeks in the year, so one and a half hours times 50 gives you 75. 75 hours, how much is an hour worth? 75 times whatever that hour is worth is technically your savings. That's how much you've saved. So that's just an example. There are many others. So convert data to monetary value. That's step number six, if I remember. Yep, that's step number six. Yeah. So what is step number seven? Step number seven is identify the cost of training. How much was the training? So identify the cost of training. Well, what is the total cost? Instructor fees. If, if you're doing an internal training, you need to put a value to the instructor's time because usually the instructor is a colleague or somebody like that. Maybe somebody traveled from somewhere, there's a hotel cost. And then there's also opportunity costs. You know, because you've left your job to go and train someone, maybe the, you had to have someone to shadow you or cover, cover, cover for you. That cost is also part of the cost. So do the complete total cost of the training, materials, manuals, meals, um, even research. Do detailed research for the training. Everything, measure, identify your total cost for the training. Yeah. So these are some of the ideas for the total cost for the training. Then, of course, what is number eight? Number eight, we're now getting into the calculation bit now. So number eight is calculate the return on investment itself. You have enough information to calculate your return on investment. Now, the easy calculation or the easy formula to be able to do that is called the benefit-cost ratio, right? Benefit-cost ratio is simply benefits divided by costs. So since you've already measured the costs, what exactly are the benefits? So this is the formula, benefit-cost ratio, BCR, is benefits divided by costs. So right at the time of instructional design, right at the time of writing your objectives, you need to understand what the benefits are, how to measure benefits, and how to measure costs. You need to agree that up front. You don't come at the end of the training and then play with the figures. <laughs> you should agree that up front. Now, it's also very important to keep it simple. So keep it simple and always involve managers. Involve managers throughout the process. You need to involve them and really even educate them so that they understand the importance of what you're doing. It's extremely critical that they understand that the importance of what you're doing. And of course, you also have to give credit to participants and then in general, all this means you're really planning for your return on investment, which is level four. All right, so keep it simple. So we're just giving you highlights of everything. And this is key things I just said here. Keep it simple. Involve management. Educate management. Give credit to participants. And then technically plan, plan your entire return on investment. Right. Let me do a quick demo. I don't like talking. Let me just open Excel and show you what I did. I did one tiny, very simple demo, uh, but you can even do a more robust demo if you like. But uh, let me see. Let me see if I can open that for you. So here I have um, staff names. So these are staff, different staff, staff numbers. You can just say staff name. 
and then maybe there are various tasks. So you know, at that time when you uh, we are planning the whole process, and um, you are looking at okay, um, what is task one? How many hours were you doing it before? How many hours are you now doing it? So this is your before. I, this task one, it took me thirty hours to do, and then um, task two took me. Um, Eight, the same task one, now it's taking me only eight hours to do. So my total time savings is 22 hours. Let's say over a year or whatever, over your measurement period, 22 hours. So this is the total hours saved. Then, of course, you should have a cost per hour. So what is the cost to you per hour? Is it the salary or, I mean, maybe he didn't do, if he didn't do the task fast and somebody else couldn't do it. So it's not as easy to as just a, a salary per hour. You should have a general cost per hour. Then you multiply that savings, that's time savings by the cost per hour, and then you have your total return on investment. So your total return on investment is 212,507 Naira. Then you, the next question is how much did the training cost? What's the cost of training, right? So if my cost of training is 100,000, this is just a simple, simple maths. Cost of training is 100,000, that means that my actual return on investment calculation is I had a return of two, uh, one, two divided by the cost. So what was my return in percentage, in percentage terms? So let me see. So in percentage terms, I had a 212.51% return on investment. Interesting. That's my ROI. So this is a very simplistic way of calculating ROI, but it's something that can be done. The only way you can do this is if you plan ahead. If clearly you said, okay, what are these tasks that we were doing that we want to change by this training? And then you measure it in detail, put it down somewhere. After maybe a month after the training, measure again and see if there was any change. But you need to isolate that change by having a, maybe a control group. So yeah, it's not as uh, it's not that easy. It takes a lot of money, and many people don't want to spend that money. But guess what? Technology is so cheap now that uh, I think you can do it without spending too much money, right? Okay, so let's quickly get back to our slides. All right, so here we said keep it simple. We did a quick demo for you on how you calculate return on investment. It's not that difficult. So there were still 10. You know, there were 10 steps, really. So the next step, which you have to calculating your return on investment, is identify intangible benefits. Because when you do that mathematical calculation, uh, it's, it's maths. It's not just monetary benefits. There are many intangible benefits. There's increased job satisfaction, for example. I mean, people are happier because they're doing their work more efficiently. They are happy, yeah? So more commitment to the organization by your staff, for example. Increased innovation and stuff. There's so many uh, um, things that are intangible. But then I, I am of the belief that you can even calculate the intangibles. The, everything can be calculated. But I'm a technical guy. I'm an analyst, right? So everything can be calculated. So, yeah. So these are some of the ideas of measuring the intangibles. So then what's the last bit? The last bit for the Jack Phillip model of return on investment is you generate uh, a study impact. So you generate a study impact, which is you're actually going to sit down and uh, do a more detailed analysis of how this affects your organization as a whole. Yeah. And then you now monitor progress in general and see how all your trainings must follow this process of having a proper return on investment calculation engine which really isn't too difficult to build, really. Um, it needs a bit of, even with Excel, is enough. Excel is quite good. It's just getting clean data. Having your data clean is, is very key. So that's what return on investment is, and that's the Jack Phillip model. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. 
because I know I started 10 minutes later and it's already 3.10. So I just have one last poll for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, do you have any questions? Or oh, before the poll, I know most of us here are experts, learning and development experts, but as Debrand Consulting, we are analysts. We train financial analysts. We, we analyst trainers, really. That's, that's our specialty. And what we do, what I could do, or, or one thing I, I also do is I've written a, a book with about 15 other authors. So 15 authors and I, we wrote a book called Destination Facilitation. We actually wrote it with um, AT, ATD is the one that published the book. And so the book is out and it's um, going through how do you use your or use your participants' um, cultural preferences or use your participants' cultural traits. For example, you're training in a class that has a Chinese, an Indian, a Nigerian, a South African, uh, somebody from Kuwait. How do you bring all of that together in your training? And how do you, how do you now take advantage of those cultural differences? So that's not really a minus, it's a big plus in the training. So, or, or for example, you're an international trainer and you're flying to China. Someone saw you online and liked your content and says, hey, come to China. What are the things you shouldn't do, things that you could do in the U.S. that you should do on how you become an facilitator? So it's destination facilitation. 15 of us wrote it, uh, 15 different countries covering the entire globe, every continent in the globe. And it's a really good read. Yeah, it's a really good read. I encourage you guys to, to go check it out. Right. I'll also share a link with you. Uh, one of the key things in measuring training, what I find, uh, especially for us that do technical training, is a big frustration when it comes to um, exams, really. Uh, because at the end of the day, when you're, when you're running an academy, uh, so you're running an academy and it's like a six months academy. So me, I think six months is way too much to run an academy anyway. So you're running this academy and at the end of the day, you have to find out whether or not people, well, how do I place people? Do I put this person in the uh, corporate finance department? Do I put him in the uh, treasury department? And what you end up doing is writing an exam. So people now write this exam and <laughs> the exam at the end of the day is what you now use to place people. But there are some people that are specialists in writing exams. I, I, I mean, I've come to realize that there are some people that are just so, so good at writing exams. So once they read and do the exam, you now place them based on that exam. It is really not a good way. A better way is throughout that training process, you are doing level two. You are doing level two, level two, level two, level two, which is gauging where whether or not the skill, knowledge, and attitude has actually passed during that training, during that academy. So you remember the clicker thing I said we use? You can use that every single day, gather data points on whether their competencies, whether or not they exhibit those competencies every single day. So you're testing different competencies for the different things you're training. Use simple quizzes for that. At the end of the day, if you, if you measure 20, 20 data points every day, and you're doing something for three months, let's even assume it's 100 days, 20 times 100 is 2,000 data points per person. Those 2,000 data points will tell you a lot. Now, if you map those 2,000 data points, you automatically know exactly where someone's strengths are. You don't even need an exam at the end of the day. So there's another way you could also do this. To me, um, one of the core skills for an analyst is financial modeling. And I'm so happy that there is finally a, an, a certification, worldwide certification, that measures precisely whether people have the skill and knowledge for financial modeling. The attitude is a different thing, but the skill and knowledge is measured during the exam. And the way they do it is this. The exam itself, in the exam, you have a laptop. You, do, you don't have a piece of You have a piece of paper, but you really have a laptop, and you're meant to build a model from scratch. So if you say you're a financial modeler, well, can you build a model? Show us during the exam. So in the exam, you build a model, a model from scratch. Now, after you build a model, you answer your questions. You're building a model and answering questions, a, a full four-hour exam. And once you're done after the exam, yes, you know how to build a model because you built it at the exam, proctored exam. 
And uh, glad to see that they are now finally uh, going to have a center in Nigeria. And these exams are going to happen on the 28th of April. So whoever uh, in your team needs this uh, financial modeling, please let us a very detailed course that we're going to do in March that covers the exam and it gets people ready. And we have an online course as well. So we have online trainings uh, that we offer. So online trainings, if I go to Office Training Hub, you'll see our online training. So we have lots of uh, online platform where we do various trainings. So this is our online platform. We have training for every kind of analyst and we're constantly loading new courses on there. And we're going to load an advanced very soon. So these are measurements of evaluations and stuff. If you change even the way people train and the way people gather the knowledge, and put things like this exam, for example, FMI, and during the exam, you're actually showing whether you have skill. Well, we'll measure attitude, but skill and knowledge directly, you either pass or fail based on skill and knowledge. So thanks everybody. I hope you enjoyed this um, webinar. We do this every month and it will join the next month. If you want me to send you an email to join, or if you have already, recall you could just tell me on the chat say yes yes you could just type yes on the chat if you want me in the next one and we'll look forward to the next one but before you go one last quiz last quiz uh let me pull that up so i have a poll so all i want to know is what's the highest level of um highest level you've ever measured so what is the highest level of training evaluation that you typically perform in your organization? Level one, level two, level three, or level four? So this is just the last question before we close. Ah, are you sure? Someone's saying level four. Return on investments. Who is that? That's, that's, that's amazing. Ah, okay. Return on investment. You actually measure return on investment. So that's cool. Well, level two sounds more like it. Level one. So the highest level you do is level four. That's good. And then level two. So most people do level two. Most people I know is level two. And even level two, they don't do it as well as, as I, I, I think they should. To measure skill, attitude, and uh, uh, skill knowledge and attitude and then then two new uh levels of level two the two two new uh, line items which is confidence and commitment yeah okay guys so thank you very much and we hope to see you in the next webinar uh next month which is the third thursday of every month so we we'll see you next month guys thank you very much for joining us and uh, next month hopefully our speaker will be able to be available and we have a speaker so thank you very much and bye bye everybody